Homicide is the killing of one human being by another human being. Homicide has been a problem to human society from its very inception and continues to be one of the biggest issues of concern to modern society. Around the world, one person is murdered about every 60 seconds. Hey, Señor de nuestras vidas. God of our lives. Envía tu aliento del cielo. Send the divine oxygen from heaven. Envía tu aliento del cielo. Send the divine oxygen from heaven. So long as we live, they too shall live. For they are now a part of us as we remember them. Whether you have kids at Bended High School or in the Buffalo schools or not, we need your help because they're young people, they're suffering. Bill and Gina's not in heaven because they came to my church. Bill and Gina is not in heaven today because they were good people. Bill and Gina are in heaven today because they put their trust in Jesus Christ. This is the young man whose father was killed on dodging time in a couple months ago. Since the new millennium, there have been over 400 homicides in the city of Buffalo. If we looked at the city of Buffalo, for example, what will we discover as the causes, consequences, potential solutions to violence, especially homicides? Our kids are dying at an alarming rate, and nobody seems to care. All right. Buffalo, the second largest city in New York State, and we don't have a homicide squad. Shame. Jobs are scarce here, but nothing stops a bullet like a job. 
But I submit, I pray that nobody leaves here today because tomorrow it can be your house. Tomorrow it can be your son. Tomorrow it can be your daughter. From 1970 through 2006, the average number of homicides in the city of Buffalo is about 51 or 52. Mm -hmm. We average over that 35 year period about a homicide a week. If there are lessons to be learned, and I think there are, we obviously haven't learned them well yeah. because we're not getting any better at it. I'm L. Nathan Hare, Executive Director of the Community Action Organization of Erie County. One of the things we have to do is to look at Buffalo as it is right now and then kind of reflect backward as to how we got uh, into this space. This is not a permanent condition. We are not born, you know, fighting dogs. We're not born, you know, rapists. We're not born dope dealers. We're not born thieves. We're not born uh, people that have a caustic attitude towards one another who, you know, who are willing to uh, shoot another person just to prove that you're strong enough or tough enough to be in somebody's gang. That's not something that's born in us. That's something that's been socialized in us over the course uh, of many, many, many tens of years. Our children's empty shoes, they'll never walk in them again. Um, our pictures, we'll never have another pictures of our kids again. So we're showing you the finalization of what we have of our kids. The feet, the, the shoes, the pictures, these things we'll never, we'll never have anymore. And um, this has got to stop. We wanted to watch our children grow up. We wanted to watch, you know, our grandbabies and hold our grandbabies. All this has been taken from us for no reason, no, no reason that... No one should have the, the right to take a life from uh, someone. Look at Brandon over here. Brandon actually was the motivation for this film, to join people to make a difference. And while on this stage, I saw Brandon. He's a little taller now, but he had the same emotions he has today, three years ago. His father's face on his T-shirt. Brandon said in 2004, on October 19th, about 2 o'clock, stop the violence. And I wanted to know, a few years from now, where would Brandon be? How many more Brandons would I know? In October of 2006, I'm filming again. This little boy Brandon is standing next to a casket. His hand is on a lady's chest. The same lady that's holding him now, that's trying to support him. He's trying to support her. Within, within two minutes afterwards, he said, I do not want to leave, I do not want to leave. The same emotions he had in 2004. Why doesn't he want to leave? Because the body that is in that casket is a young man who my signature got out of jail. My name is Allison Wells, and my 22-year-old son was gunned down on November the 1st of 2000. I can't believe I'm standing here saying that, looking at his tims. The only way we're going to solve this is find out where the guns are coming from, because we're 11, 12-year-old, 13, 15-year-old kids getting weapons. Come on. I don't know if it is the corner stores, that's what they say. How come somebody hasn't said something? I'm just here to say that, you know, everybody keeps assuming that her death obviously is, is solved and that we've forgotten. We haven't forgotten. Her murder is still unsolved. We're hoping that somebody can still come forth with some type of information, some new leads or something. And like the other mother said, we still are too. We're out there too, asking questions and looking for information on who killed my daughter. And once again, we're not going to sleep either. and We're not going to rest like you are doing. And I'm going to be out here until I can't be out here anymore looking to find out who killed my daughter. Well, so far, I, I, I'm proud of the fact that we, um, we started a mobile response unit, which is kind of take off of the old flex squad. But we um, enabled them and empowered them to go after some of our, our gangs and going after guns. Um, they've been very successful in getting a lot of guns off the street. We had a very successful gun buyback program this year. Um, over 878 guns were um, turned in on the gun buyback program. We've also piloted the camera project. So those are some of the things. This year, um, for two years now, last year we brought crime down by about 7%. This year, violent crime is down in double digits. Um, the homicides have decreased to levels below the 2005 level when we had 56 homicides. Um, even though we had a spike in homicides last year, in response to the fact that we're being very aggressive in going after drugs on the street. There's nothing that could express to a parent what the loss of a, a child and of a loved one is like. My oldest sister 
was a victim of a homicide. And so I know the, the feeling of loss that you have. When I'd be calling to get information, I get the same thing over and over, never no phone calls returned, I just gave up on that part. Uh, that's why it feels as though, you know, to, to myself, that's a closed case. Nobody's even arrested or anything? No one was ever arrested, ever. Can't give up. You gotta keep calling. Do not give up. Do not. Like yes. more don't on. do it doesn't keep doing it. Your kid's not here that. to speak for themselves. Yeah, but I'm and saying, I had I a detective that my son will be four years Monday is his anniversary. I have a detective that I work with the whole four years. He's been wonderful. He's had my back and that's from me calling him all the time. He calls me. I came back home as I pulled up, neighbors started running towards the car. Mr. Harris, Mr. Harris, your son been shot. Get out of here. You know, this is like a nightmare. You know, my son been shot. Where? Okay, we're doing a hunger strike. It's day three. Uh, two little kids were murdered here in this uh, plaza right here. There were over 90 shots fired from across the street. We're from Stop Killing Clothing. I have my partner here. He's supporting me, but I'm the only one actually starving. Ninth. I'm in the fruit belt, getting out the car, going to check up on my son, because I got a teenager. As soon as I got out the car, about 20 shots was fired. I got hit with one. I was blessed, because I'm not crippled, I'm not dead. Just, just need to stop. They need to stop. I think of the old African proverb. It takes a whole village to raise a child. But no. Nowadays, it takes everyone, community, worldwide. The ancient African proverb says that it takes a village to raise a child. We all know that. But we have no villages. It's my son, Devontae Murray. He got shot September 7th, excuse me, September 7th of this year. Uh, passed away that Saturday morning, September 8th. Devontae was coming out the store, um, getting a t-shirt. And, you know, as he was walking, from my understanding, because I wasn't there, as he was walking, um, he just got caught in a crossfire and one bullet hit him and he fell. I think the key thing for us to try to turn this situation around it must start with the education system, educating our young people, making sure that they are prepared. I went to one funeral and uh, the young man was um, in the casket with money in his hand. I didn't understand that. Also at the same funeral, a mother came in in shackles and was handcuffed uh, uh, because she was incarcerated. Another funeral I went to, um, the young man had his hat turned backwards in shorts and shorts and colors. And, and I asked the mother, I said, why are you burying him like that? She said, that's the way he wanted to go. So I said, how did he know he was going to die at such a young age? But when I look at the students at these funerals, uh, it's just blank faces. They look angry. A black man in America today without a professional skill, without a college degree, is a dead man walking. I went to jail for armed robbery and a murder back in 1976. Um, again, gangs. 
You know, I grew up on the east side of Buffalo on Cold Spring Street. I was in a gang called the Cold Spring Matadors. And um, I, my mom had 12 kids. There was no father in the house. So my mom couldn't do everything. So I thought that if I go out and I rob a store and I do this and I do that to help put some food on the table. And, and, and after I went to jail and found out that this is definitely wasn't the answer because there's had to be something better for my life, I got to know God. Just like uh, Pastor Gene Copeland from Project Lead Ministries, 20 some years ago came into the prison, mentored me, stuck by me. I mean, even when I fell away from God, started getting high, doing things, this brother stuck with me. And because he saw something in me. So now I want to be that same, get that same love that he gave to me. Enough is enough. We have to start speaking up, standing up, taking back our communities because we can't all leave here. And just like Miss Jackie lost three children, it will be more parents losing three children if we don't take our streets back. By the grace of God, I pray. And I ask the Lord to keep me holding on. And I read the Bible. And a lot of people see me walking and, well, I try to keep a lot off my mind. And that's why I work a lot. But I thank God for Monica, because she, she hangs in there with me. And by the grace of God, people call and see how I'm doing. I'm doing a little okay, though. But sometimes I cry a lot, but I miss my three sons. And I did the best I can for them. <laughs> You know, Monica, <laughs> Monica did not. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. No, I'm telling the truth. Mm -hmm. I didn't drink and smoke and do drugs That's or okay. anything. Okay. And I, I used to be out there trying to help my children. I did. Um, I was a real good mother to my children. And I, yeah. I talked to Jackie and said, I feel somebody voodooed me. I do. I feel somebody put a curse on me. I lost my three sons. I was upset yesterday a little bit. I feel somebody put a curse on me. I don't know why I lost Randy and Twan. And that was my babies. I loved them a lot. I did a lot for my kids. I struggled and everything. But I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm just praying that we'll put all of ourselves in the Stop the Violence movement out of business. Frequent flyers. They have been shot before, they've been stabbed before, they've been involved in altercations. And it's amazing sometimes when they come in and the police know them without even asking for identification because they've been involved in some of these violent acts. It's really just a small segment of the community that's involved in really violent acts, the ones that carry guns on a regular basis and different things. They're involved in gangs and uh, different situations where they need to protect themselves. None of it's really actually getting through to people that this is a final act. This is not a movie. This is not a Wesley Snipes movie or Eddie Murphy where he's going to be in the next sequel that when these people get killed in the streets of Buffalo, New York, they're dead forever. I think that the mentality that to hold a gun and settle a difference, your differences, um, at the end of the gun has so many much more far-reaching consequences than the general public might see initially. One of the things that strikes me the most at a shooting scene or at a homicide scene is always the anguish and the sorrow when someone is laying there dead. And I think that that's what people need to put in the forefront of their mind, is that's the end result. Folks, she's going to be coming to the right here. And so whatever you may think about it prior to that consequence, that is cool, that is, you know, that you're fat, you're hot, whatever, because you can carry one, show one, shoot one. That's what you need to think about um, because that's the reality. The rest of it is 
it's a fallacy. It's it's some type of illusion. Well, there was a um, uh, homicide over on 320 Coons uh, two years ago, where four people were murdered, and um, that was my brother, my niece, a friend of ours that grew up together, and another friend of my sister's. The stories that we got <clears throat> when it finally did go to trial was that. Um, they thought uh, <clears throat> my niece was going to be a snitch. So instead of them uh, talking to her, they decided that uh, they were going to go in and kill everybody that was in the house, and which happened to be uh, my brother, my niece, there was my sister that was there, and also the children. Now, is that the case when... Um the, the little baby had fell off the lady's arm and they were, they were shooting after the baby. Is that the case? Yes. Yes, sir. She had the baby in her arms running out of the house and um, they shot her in the back and the baby was laying down next to her. And, and he stood over and told her to die. It's like um, we're under terrorism here mm. amongst our own people. <laughs> I stand here at the overpass of the intersection of Ferry and Grider Streets, near the location of Umoja Food Store, where William Peoples has begun a program, the Community Reward Program, aimed at resolving unsolved murders in the city of Buffalo. But this is a location on the east side of Buffalo, a cross section of zip codes 14211 and 14215 that account for a majority of the homicides in the city of Buffalo, at least in recent time. We remember Sister Sean Lucci. Cannot read at the second or third grade level, 
you're gonna end up in prison no matter what. And the thing is, is that every day that you put an individual in jail, you're spending seventy-five to hundred thousand dollars for I mean for for courts, and then another fifty thousand dollars a year for prison. So if you put a person in jail within three years, you're spending almost two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. But you cannot send none of one one of our kids to Harvard or Yale. You don't give them an opportunity for them to get guac. When your children are dying, you are dying. That is the nature of things. Buffalo is a city that is finally on the move. Uh, it's a city where we are now seeing $3.6 billion of economic development projects that have been announced, that have uh, begun, that are moving forward, and some that this year will actually come to completion. The uh, gun buyback program was something that we patterned after successful gun buybacks in other cities. And our buyback was phenomenally successful. We were able to get 878 guns off the street in one day. Now, over 500 of those guns were workable, usable, dangerous guns that could have been used on the street of, the com of this community to commit a crime. And we think one of the contributing factors to the problem of homicide is that there are people who feel hopeless. They don't see a bright future for themselves, and we've been working to change that. I'm working with other organizations to create an event called Remembering and Pledging. Remembering those murdered in our city this, this past year and pledging nonviolence. We, need, we know we need to work together, first of all, to remember the families, to support them as they go through this very difficult time, and then also to do whatever we can to create a city that has less violence. sister uh, more than once or not even once maybe uh, what to do because she seemed to have a knack for knowing what was necessary. No, it was always giving of the more, giving more, how I can better other people's lives. It was never anything for what Karen would get credit for. I truly believe one of the biggest lessons from Karen's death uh, is the, the challenge for, for myself, for all of us, uh, the, the lesson of forgiveness and how to extend forgiveness. Well, I have learned to see, and I hope that other people, parents have learned too, to really love your children and give them as much time as you can because you never know when death is going to knock on the door. I lost my father to violence, and I don't understand why. And I have to ask somebody questions of why did they do that to my father. They hurt my mom, me, my grandmother, my family members, everybody in the state hurts them. They did know Brady Lewis has no father. The question is not what they will give us. The question is not how they are going to hold us down. The question is what the hell are we going to do? That's the
knees That's why we get sweated by police Blacks be acting like beef And we get treated like that We want our bank rolls back Arguments gonna attack We wanna go grab the gas and go blast back We need to look past that Find ways to subtract that Train of thinking We slowly sinking into a ditch In which we show King Vic Let's try to cover the pit Make a powerful switch from a criminal To own an industrial Still sporting baggy clothes But they classy though Keeping it real and above the low And you know why It's accepted cause it's